Hello everyone, welcome to this video discussion. My focus in this discussion is gesture and discourse. Now, we should be aware that in discourse analysis, this field involves not only the analysis of verbal discourses. There are also nonverbal ones that we need to consider in analyzing discourses. That is why discourse analysis becomes a broad field primarily because when you do discourse analysis, you also need to consider not only the verbal, maybe um, spoken or written, but also the nonverbal, such as the gestural discourse or the meaning of a discourse through analyzing the different gestures used by the discourse maker. And so that will be the focus of this video discussion. So before anything else, I'd like to give a brief introduction of this topic. Kendon in 2004 defined gestures as actions that have the features of manifest deliberate expressiveness. So this means that gestures are primarily used for expression purposes. We use gestures because we believe that there are certain ideas or emotions that we could not really express effectively using plain words. And so we use the nonverbal ones, such as gestures, for us to effectively denote or perhaps connote the meaning we are trying to relay to the other discourse makers or the audience. A gesture is an unwitting, non-accidental, non-goal directed action orchestrated by speaker created significances having features of manifest expressiveness that enacts imagery, not necessarily by the hands or hands alone, and is generated as part of the speaking. So there are certain elements that we need to consider based on this definition. First one, this one is uh, where gestures involve speaker-created uh, significances. This means that there are certain significations done when gestures are used, meaning they represent a meaning. They represent also what is the intended or the implied meaning of the discourses uttered by the discourse makers. Secondly, this course may also involve gestures because they are also generated as part of speaking. Meaning when you speak and then you use gestures, they automatically become a part of the discourse or the utterances made. Now in conversations, route directions, narrations, and so on, speech-synchronized gestures are by far the most frequent kind. So when you say speech-synchronized gestures, these are the gestures that we use in parallel with the words or discourses that we say. Now, why is it very significant for us to analyze gestures in the context of discourses? Remember that in order for us to fully understand the meaning of these discourses, given a specific um, communicative situation or event, you need to consider the 360-degree perspective of how to analyze discourses, which means you always have to look at the different factors that could have affected the delivery of the discourses. And one of these factors is the use of gesture. Now, we also have this concept called communicative dynamism. The gesture and the synchronous speech jointly forms a peak of communicative dynam dynamism. Now, what is this concept all about? Communicative dynamism is the extent to which a given spoken or gestured form pushes the communication forward. This means that communicative dynamism is the, the gauge, okay, it's the indicator as to how far the communication has begun already or how far the communication has went given the certain signals used in the discourses. Not only does the material form of reference register existing degrees of communicative dynamism, but also each form is an active signal. So when you talk about active signal, signaling that the degree of communicative dynamism at that moment is being maintained or changed. I don't know if you've noticed this one, but in most conversations, there will really be active signals which will help you identify if there is movement in the communicative process. For example, when you are talking with a person and then that person tells you go on, so the phrase go on there becomes a signal. It becomes an active signal. Now, what makes it more active is when the word go on is paired up with a gesture. For example, you say, go on. So the use of this gesture becomes an active signal as well to 
mean that the discourse maker or you, in that case, may continue with what you are talking about. So that is communicative dynamism. Communicative dynamism tells us the extent to which a given spoken or gestured form pushes the communication forward. So how far does the moving forward of the discourse become? So that is communicative dynamism. Next one is the con concept of psychological predicate. Now, the gesture with its synchronous speech also formed what Vygotsky termed a psychological predicate. And this newsworthy content is differentiated from a field of meaningful oppositions. Now, I'm going to discuss this one further by telling you that a psycholo psychological predicate first marks a significant departure in the immediate context. For example, if we are talking about matter A or topic A and then you gave a signal leading to the discussion of topic B. So that means that signal used there may contain the psychological predicate, which will give you the signal as well that you may proceed to the next topic, which means also that you are making a significant departure from the immediate context. And second one, it implies this context as the background. So the psychological predicate signals or gives not only gives you the signal that you may proceed to the next topic but it also introduces you to the context of the next topic so that is psychological predicate so for example when you are talking with another person and then let's say in the preceding utterances or discourses you are talking about your birthday let's say you, you you're telling that person my birthday is come friday would you like to join us or would you like to attend my party and then that person is not really interested. So the person gives a signal, okay, an active signal, which will give you a hint that that person is not really interested in attending your birthday party. So the person responds to you by saying, you know what, there's a new store opening in SM, for example. So that second line there, the you know what, becomes the active signal, which will give you the hint that there is now Departure from the original context of the communication to a new context. And then you know what there becomes a very important indicator that there is indeed movement. Okay, there is communicative dynamism. Now it becomes a more active signal when it is paired with a gesture. For example, if that person tells you, you know what, and then he uses this gesture, you know what? So this gesture now becomes also an active agent which will signal that there is movement from topic A to topic B. Now, the context there, okay, the statement of person B telling you that there is a new store opening in SM becomes a statement which contains the psychological predicate. Okay? Why does it contain the psychological predicate? First one, because it gives you the mark. Okay? It gives you the mark of the significant departure in the immediate context, meaning it gives you the idea that this is a new topic. And at the same time, it also implies the context of um, the background, meaning it gives you the background or the context of what you are talking about. But in that context, it's already a new context. Now, combining gesture speech into a psychological predicate implies that every synchronous co-expressive gesture speech unit is equally a discourse unit. So this means that Whenever you are talking about discourses, it involves not only pure discourses or words, because even a gesture and speech combination may already be considered as one discourse unit. So that is why I am introducing the function of gestures in discourse analysis, because this may also be a primary concern in discourse analysis. And this could also be an interesting field of study in linguistic research. Now, space may also be considered as discourse. So the space um, being occupied when speaking, okay, the proximal distance, or it could also be um, wherein the gestures are made. So space itself, where gestures are made, embodies discourse themes. Let's take at these images, for example. They're supposed to be the good guys, but she really did kill him. And then please do observe the gestures used by this person in scene A and scene B. So there is now movement in terms of hands. And then, and he's a bad guy, 
but he really didn't kill him. Okay? Now, if we look at this one very carefully, there is a big, big difference. There's a big distinction. Here, it denotes appearance. Okay? And then here, it denotes reality. Here, it denotes appearance again. And then this one denotes reality. Now, if you also consider the context of the gesture here, or the discourses here, they're supposed to be the good guys, good guys, but she really did kill him. Now, the gesture used by this person when mentioning the she here being the killer is downwards. And then, if we consider this one, in scenario C and D, we can see that the person here used open palms and then another um, pointing finger, okay, or this kind of palm directing to something or to a certain direction. But if you notice, the discourse here emphasizes that he here is not the killer. So meaning there could be a relevance in terms of the gestures used and also with the context of the communication. So in the analysis of gestures in discourse analysis, it's very, very important that you understand not only the discourses, but also the gestures involved. Because the gestures will also add to the interpretation of the appropriate semantics, which means that gestures are there to help us clearly and correctly identify what is really meant by the discourses. Okay? So maybe we could say that discourse and um, gestures or gestures, when analyzed according to space, could be twofold things that we need to consider in this course analysis. Pointing is also a famous, or it's also a well-known gesture used here in the Philippines. So pointing, almost every gesticulation includes some deixis. When you say deixis, it means a reference. So for example, here in the Philippines, we are fond of using pointing, okay, just pouting our lips, or pointing um, a certain uh, location or direction of something when we are asked about where is this found, or where is this located, we Filipinos are fond of using our mouth to point, or we simply point. We do not really give an appropriate answer by saying the location of something or the position of something or the direction towards something. Because for us, pointing becomes a meaningful tool for us to expressively okay, denote the what is really meant in terms of our responses. There is also a specific basis used when we point, meaning there's a point of reference. So, for example, in this image, you can see that this man is pouting his lips. That means that there is a sort of reference being used. There is basis here. There is reference involved. Because even if the man did not really point the location using his fingers or using his hands, but we can already understand the location of that um, referred item or referred entity being asked of him okay, to identify in terms of location or position. So that means, again, almost every gesticulation or gestures that we use include some basis. Pointing, many points in this course are metaphoric in fact. Rather than indicate a locus in space for a reference, okay, rather than concretely identify where the location or the position of something is, they create a spot in space to stand for the reference that otherwise could not have a spatial locus. So meaning it gives us this imaginary perception of where it is actually located, even if you are not given the concrete one. So for example, when you say, where is this mall located? Okay, and then you know that the mall is just nearby. So you just point okay, using your lips perhaps. So that means even if the person was not really given enough number of information to really understand the location of the mall, you would automatically understand that there is already reference being made. And that pointing will tell you that that is the direction leading towards the exact location of the mall that you are asking. So that is the essence of pointing. So pointing is also a form of gesture that you need to consider in this course analysis. Now, we have this set of discourses shown on the screen, and I want you to critically analyze how gestures are used by these two discourse makers. For example, we have here Mr. A and Mr. B. How do you like Chicago compared to, did you go to school there or ah? Uh, and then points to a shared space, meaning when you say shared space, it's a space that both of them commonly understand or know. 
And then Mr. B answers, I did go to school there. And then pointing again. They went to school there, then pointing to left. Also, circles the left, meaning there is another um, school maybe identified somewhere in the left side. And then Mr. A responds, uh-huh. And then Mr. B says, I, points to the share space, I, um, then points to the left. So I came back, points to the share space. Okay? So that means this one in itself already suggests a strong meaning. So if you are to analyze this one, you should not take this literally because there could be another meaning concealed underneath these discourses used by Mr. B. And then, oh, uh -huh, which means that Mr. A here clearly identifies or clearly understands rather what Mr. B was referring to in his preceding statements. And then the rest of the um, conversations here or discourses would also tell that there has or there was understanding between Mr. A and Mr. B because gestures became an assistant. Okay, it assisted very well both of them to really understand the discourses uttered by each of these two discourse makers. Now, in terms of gestures, gestures like speech can be thought of in terms of units, and it is often useful to segment a gesture from the stream of general activity. Phases of gesture include three. First one, we have the preparation phase. Second, we have the stroke phase. And third is the retraction phase. Now, what's the difference among these three? When you talk about preparation phase, this is the movement of the hand as it readies itself for the gestural stroke. Second one, we have the stroke phase. This is the most effortful and most meaningful phase of the gesture. And lastly, we have the retraction phase. It is where the hand returns to resting position. So for example, when you say, I believe that this is something that we must do. So the beginning of the movement of your hand like that is already the preparation phase, which tells you that you are preparing for a gesture that you will have to use to back up your discourse. And then the use of the gesture itself like this is already the stroke phase, meaning there is an effort initiated or exerted because you would like to emphasize a certain point. And then the moment that you rest your hands and you no longer use your hands, that is already where retraction phase exists or happens. Now, it may be followed by the preparation or stroke phase of a subsequent gesture, which means that it's cyclical. So once you are done with the retraction phase, another phase happens, so on and so forth. So that is something that we could also analyze in terms of gestural use. There are also certain ways of classifying gestures. First one could be through the articulator used to produce, maybe head or hand. So for example, if you wish to understand or if you wish to unravel the common gestures used, may them be head or hand gestures, this could also be an interesting linguistic research to explore. Second one is according to function and communication. Are your gestures interactive or representational? Now, when you say interactive, gestures that manage the communicative dialogue between interlocutors, elsewhere called pragmatic, locutionary, or discourse gestures. So this is the gesture or the type of gesture that we use when we interact with people. For example, when we casually converse with someone, and then we use also these um, gestures unconsciously, then these gestures are interactive by nature. On one hand, we have representational, gestures that communicate something about the topic or primary content of the utterance. Okay? For example, when you say this okay, or this, meaning you're pointing to something, and what you're talking about is that that this there, using your hand gesture, is already the context, okay? Or it will be the content of the thing or, the, or of the discourse that you are talking about. So again, interactive is what you use during interaction when you converse and representational is what you use when you, re, you, when you would like to refer to something okay, that does not necessarily exist at the moment of conversation or communicative event. So that's representational. So again, understanding gestures becomes very important when you would like to understand discourses as well. These are twofold things that you need to consider. When you analyze verbal, uh, verbal discourses, definitely you also need to understand the context. And in order for you to have a full or deep understanding of the context, it is also significant that you explore the world of gestures in those contexts so that you could really understand what those gestures and discourses really mean. Okay? 
So I hope you have fully understood my um, video discussion. Should you have questions, can you post them on the open forum and then I would be glad to address each one of them. Thank you very much for watching this video discussion.